I want to focus on a question which has been spoken a lot about and which uh, a lot of the Bible critics have tried to use to undermine the Torah and, and you know, to say that it was invented and it was, uh, you know, multiple versions that were, that were pieced together. And that is the name of Hashem. The, the first verse here says, Bereshis bara Elohim. Hashem is referred to as Elohim. We don't pronounce Hashem's name. We don't pronounce any of Hashem's names. So whenever there's a hey or H, we replace it with a K. So throughout the first chapter of, of Bereshis, it's always Elohim. That's how Hashem is referred to. If you go to the second chapter, he has a different name. His name is Hashem. Hashem is also a euphemism. We don't pronounce Hashem's name. When I say Hashem, I'm referring to the name that was spelled yud ke vav -ke. And again, I'm not even spelling it correctly. It's really Hayes. I'm calling them Ks because uh, out of respect for Hashem's name, we don't say it or spell it. So in the first chapter, it's always Elohim. In the second chapter, he gets named Hashem, as we call him. And then throughout the Torah, these names are used interchangeably in various contexts. So the question is, why? Why is it that the name changes? And especially if you look at the context, uh, in the first chapter, Hashem is, Elohim is presented as the creator. Elohim created everything. And Elohim said, let there be light. Elohim said, let there be the sky, etc. In the second chapter, it says, Hashem Elohim created everything. So everyone discusses, you know, what is, what is this change in name? And um, as I mentioned, uh, they don't really deserve credence. They don't really deserve to be mentioned at all. But the Bible critics uh, have, have taken this and tried to undermine the Torah with it and say, oh, there's, you know, there's two versions of this story. There's the version of Elohim, and then there's a the version with Hashem. And they got combined into one book, but they were really written by different people. Um, but uh, the truth is, this is not a new question that was invented by the Bible critics. It's an old question, which... The, uh, all the traditional commentators have, have dealt with. And before I try to work on this question, I want to just discuss this idea of giving Hashem any kind of name. What does it mean to give Hashem a name? Or give, what does it mean to give anything a name? So a real name says something. My name doesn't say anything. My name says that my mother had a fond memory, memories of Uncle Jake, and so she gave me my name. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, a real name, a Hebrew name that the Torah gives for something describes what that thing is. And if you know how to dis dissect the name and, and really translate it perfectly, you can you can uh, learn something about what that thing really is. Now, when we give Hashem a name, that's a little complicated because Hashem can't be defined. Hashem is infinite. Hashem is indefi undefinable. He's, he's, he's infinite, he's perfect, he's all-powerful, he's the, he's the true existence. He exists in, in a truer sense than anything else that he created. So to define Hashem with a name is kind of a, a uh, contradiction in terms, because we can't define Hashem. And the truth is that this difficulty is, is a much deeper problem. It's not just defining him with a name that's a problem, even the whole idea of Hashem relating to us is a philosophical problem, which, which people have tried to deal with uh, for, for millennia. This was uh, something that really turned off the philosophers from even believing in Hashem. Because the idea that we have this infinite God who's undefinable, infinite, unchangeable, and at the same time, we, we claim that he relates to the world, he reacts to what happens in the world. How's that possible? If he's unchanging, how can he do something new based on what happens here? And there's only one good answer to that question. And the answer is, I don't know. That's the answer. We can't know. Nobody can really understand because we're finite beings. Because we are creations, we can't understand Hashem in His true essence. And we can't understand what it means that an infinite being has a relationship and responds to the finite. We can't understand that. But 
it's a fact. It's an historical fact. It's a fact that plays out in our national history and in world history as the Torah tells it and as our national memory uh, recalls it. Remember, we're a very large nation and we have these traditions from our parents. The entire nation has the same traditions. They all tell the same stories. So these things happened. Hashem did actively and visibly interfere with the course of events in this world in front well, of millions of witnesses. Why would you say interfere if it's his creation? I, I didn't mean that in a negative sense. Okay. I meant, but uh, in the sense of just uh, responding to it. Influence. It. Influence. Okay, that would be a better word. Mm -hmm. When you look at the exodus from Egypt, Hashem did active miracles and... You know, he made major changes in the world actively as a response to something that was going on. So Hashem does relate to the world, and he is infinite. How does that work? Well, he knows very well. I don't. But he understands it. Um, it's kind of a, it's a dichotomy that, that we have to live with, and we have to be humble, and we have to admit our, lim our limitations that we just can't really understand this, but we can accept it. Um, there are There is a, a large body of literature written by the Jewish philosophers um, where they tried to kind of drive home this point that Hashem is infinite, Hashem doesn't have a body, He doesn't have a personality, He just is. And anytime the Torah talks about the hand of Hashem or the eye of Hashem or the nose of Hashem, uh, they always try to stress this idea that he doesn't really have a hand, he doesn't really have an eye and a nose. It's all a metaphor for his for you know something that we can understand, but but not actually what actually describes him because he can't be he can't be defined. And that's true, and it's a very important principle. Um, however, Hashem, in his infinite capability, also chooses to relate to this world and to respond to the world. And he created the world, and he presents himself to the world with a certain personality. It's not his true essence, but it's the personality that he wants to present to the world and he wants us to relate to. So on the one hand, yes, he does not have a body. He's not definable. We can't understand him. On the other hand, he wants us to relate to him as he presents himself to us. Kind of a hard concept, but it's a lot to think about. It's uh, you know something to keep in mind as you as you go through the Torah and as you go through various all, all the Jewish literature, and especially as you go through the prayer book. You as as you daven, you have to you keep this idea in mind that you're davening. Yes, you're davening to this infinite being, but you're also davening to someone who chooses to relate to the world and respond to it. And that's where Hashem's name comes in. Hashem's name describes not him as as he is in his infinite uh, existence but as he is in the way he wants to relate to us now being an infinite being there are many ways he can relate to us and therefore he has many names there are many names of hashem each one represents some facet of this personality that he chooses to use when he relates to us uh, an example that we can relate to you have a, a doctor. So there are people in the world that call him daddy because that's who he is. To them, that's the only thing he is. Other people call him doctor because that's who he is. And that's all he is. It's the only relationship they have. Other people are colleagues. Other people are friends. They, you know, he's a member of their golf club that, that they go to every Sunday. You know, people have different facets to their personalities and and different facets to how they relate to others and each one is a different name and the same applies to Hashem. Hashem is Hashem, Hashem is Elohim, Hashem has many different names because each one represents something about how he relates to us and how we relate to him. Now there are so many facets to this, in fact an infinite number of facets to this because Hashem is infinite, but there are two main categories that get focused on and they go by various different names. The classic names for them is Chesed and Gevura. 
or Rachamim and Din. Hashem has his personality of kindness. He wants to do good to people. He wants to give in, in an unlimited way. Hashem is unlimited. He wants to give in an unlimited way. He wants to... Right now. I'll call you back. Yeah, I'm going to class. I'll call you back. Okay, bye. Sorry. All right. He wants to be kind to everybody, and then that's part of his personality, kindness. Another part of his personality is din, is, is judgment, where he, you know, yes, he wants to be kind to people, but he also wants to set down the law, and, you know, there's a certain, every action you do has a consequence, and, uh, you know, that's also part of who he is. And these two aspects of his personality are represented by the two names, Hashem and Elohim. Hashem represents kindness, mercy, and Elohim represents severity or judgment or justice. That's these two ideas. Now, in the as we mentioned, the first chapter only mentions the name Elohim. Sorry, I want to go back for a moment. I want to just, uh, you know, focus on these two names. Let's just uh, kind of dissect the words. There's a lot of, there are very various different explanations for how each of these names represents what they represent. And, uh, you know, each explanation is at, its, is at a different level. You can go, you know, on a very deep Kabbalistic level. You can go on a more surface level uh, explanation. Um, I'm, I'm only going to touch the surface right now. If you look at the name Elohim, you can split it up into two parts. There's Aleph Lamed at the beginning, which means Kale, if it's referring to Hashem, or but it's not always referring to Hashem. Sometimes it's El. Aleph Lamed is El, and it means power. Elohim is plural for El, for power. Hashem is all the different powers all together. All the powers of the universe are all from Hashem. You can look at the same idea a little differently. If you look at the hey, there's Aleph Lamed hey, and then the Yud Mem, the plural Yud Mem. Aleph Lamed hey, Ela means these. These means you're looking at a specific group of items and you're calling, you're saying these things. If you pluralize that, you say Ela, and then you say Im, which is plural. You're taking all the visas in the world, all of the all the different things in the world, which can be identified, and you're unifying them into one purpose, and that is Hashem. Every separate power or every separate item in in the universe has its own identity, is not necessarily directly connected with anything else. Each thing is separate, until you enter Hashem into the equation, and that's one unifying force that gives purpose to everything and connects everything. So that you could have a, a galaxy that's, you know, light years, millions of light years away from here, but it has a purpose that relates to this world. Because Hashem wants me to see that little dot in the sky for whatever reason. So that, that unifies everything in the universe, all the various these, all the various things in the universe, all the various powers in the universe are, are, are all unified into one central purpose, one central power, and that is Hashem. In that sense, that's din. That is justice. That's, um, that's setting down the law of the universe where everything has a purpose and you can't violate that purpose. And if you do violate that purpose, there's a consequence because everything's connected and everything serves one central purpose. That's Elohim. And we can't really get around that. You know, there, there is the other aspect where Hashem wants to be kind and He wants to be merciful, but there, there is that aspect of Din where Hashem wants His creation to be a certain way and He, he wants to set down the law. And at the end of the day, it all comes back to Din. It all comes back to this idea that Hashem sets down the law, and, and that's the way it is. But then you have the name Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, and that represents mercy and kindness. 
how does it represent mercy and kindness? So again, this is uh, you know you could go you could look at this in in so at so many levels, but just on the surface, and we spoke about this on Rosh Hashanah. If you look at Hashem's name, Yud Kei Vav Kei, the the root of that name is Hey Yud Hey, or Hey Vav Hey, which is basically the same thing. Vav and Yud are interchangeable. Hey Yud Hey or Hey Vav Hey means existence. So Ho Ve means present. Haya means past, was. Yihye means will be. And the name of Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, combines all those three concepts. Was, is, will be. And if you look at the word carefully, I'm not going to pronounce it because we don't pronounce this name ever, even when we're davening. We mispronounce it. But if you look at the name as it's spelled out, it means he will bring into existence. That's the, the, the simplest way to translate the name, yud ke vav ke, is he will bring into existence. Which is interesting because he did bring into existence. This is past, it should be in the past tense. He brought everything in, in, into existence. And yet we're looking at it, or his name is in the future tense. So why is that? And the answer is that Hashem is always bringing into existence. It's always in the future. Hashem is always leading the universe into, toward his goal. And he's helping things develop to their potential. Hashem is able to look at anything, and instead of looking at what it is right now, he looks at, at what it can become. And what can he make it into? How can he help it develop its potential? And that is Rachman, that's kindness. That's this idea that Hashem's always looking at the potential, always looking at, at the positive, what could come out of something. So you have something that's, you have a person who's terrible, he's doing terrible things, but he has one little grain of goodness in him, and if Hashem can figure out, which he can, how to bring that out, how to get the person to develop that, the person can then uh, you know, turn around, he can turn himself around and, and become better. And when a person decides to turn himself around to become better, Hashem is there to help him accomplish that. And it's not easy. We, we get into ruts, we get into uh, patterns and habits, and it's very difficult for us to break out of them. But Hashem is there to help us with his always freshly creating everything and recreating everything. He's always bringing into existence He's always bringing us into existence. And that is the ultimate mercy and kindness that Hashem can do. And that's the idea of tshuva. That's the idea of repentance, where there's always an opportunity to, to pick up again and recreate yourself with Hashem's help, recreate your life, and start over a whole new life. Which, uh, you know, before, before the event is very difficult to even imagine. You, you, you have a certain way of life and you think, you know, I'm, I'm just going to change everything. Very difficult to imagine doing it. And then when you actually try to do it, it's doable. And that's Hashem helping you to do it. That's Hashem recreating who you are as a person, recreating your personality. And after the fact, someone looks back and is like, wow, I, I did it. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. I changed. I'm not the same person I was. So that's the name Havaya, that's the name Yud Kei Vav Kei, where Hashem is merciful, is kind, as opposed to the name Elohim, which has to do with justice, which has to do with, with uh, setting down the law and, and carrying out ju uh, justice against people, or with people. Now, back to our question. The first chapter of Bereshis starts with Elohim, Hashem is always referred to as Elohim. Second chapter, he gets the name Hashem. What changed? Why, why did he why did he change the way he's referred to in the second chapter? So Rashi tells us it's for this reason. He created the world with the name Elohim. That was his relationship with the world, was just strict justice. And then, after having created the world, he saw that the world can't exist that way. 
The world can't exist with strict justice. We have to, we're not used to this idea. If you think about it, Hashem is the ultimate king. Hashem is, is all powerful. He's infinite. He created me. So if I'm going to go and not listen to him, I'm going to do something he doesn't like. So then my whole right to exist disappears. So I die. That's it. Immediately. For that, but for the world to try to, to for the world to exist that way, it can't. Like the world can't go on that way. The world can't just be burning up every two seconds because someone messed up. So Hashem introduced this idea of mercy into the world. And he combined the two. There's there's justice, but there's also mercy. Now Rashi says this, but uh, we need to modify it a little bit. Because we understand Hashem created the world. He knew what was going to happen. It's not like he thought of this. You know, it took him a week to create the world, and then he realized, oh, one second, I messed up. I forgot about mercy. I got to do that. That doesn't happen with Hashem. Hashem knows everything. Hashem knows what's going to happen, and he he doesn't make errors like that. So what it has to mean is that Hashem understood this beforehand. He created the world with the name Elohim, with an understanding that at some point he's going to have to switch over to Hashem, to this name of mercy. Now, what point is that going to be? When is it that Hashem has to switch over to mercy? And the answer is, as soon as he creates man. Because everything in the universe, as we mentioned last week, everything in the universe except for man does whatever Hashem tells it. They don't mess up. Man messes up. People mess up, and that's how Hashem created us. It's not its not a mistake. He wanted us to be this way. He wanted us to work on ourselves. Everything in, in the universe just listens to him and does what he says, but he wanted one creature who's, who's going to earn his right, earn, earn his way. So man is created with temptations and uh, desires for things that are not good for him, and he has to overcome that. But in order for that to happen, Hashem needs to introduce this idea of mercy. Now, we have to understand this concept of mercy because it can't be contradictory. Hashem's mercy cannot contradict his sense of justice. So how does that work? You know, in a, I was once talking to a, uh, a Christian doctor, a devout Christian, and he's trying to, he tried to tell me, he asked me the question of, uh, you know, why is it that after the golden calf, a lot of people were punished, a lot of people died, but Aaron did not die. Aaron goes on living. So I, I gave him the traditional answer, which we can discuss when we get there. But he said to me, he didn't like that answer. And, and his answer was that, you know, Hashem is, God is God, and he can give grace wherever he wants. This idea of grace is, is not really a Jewish concept. Just giving grace and, and forgiving and forgoing, it's not really a Jewish concept. Hashem is merciful, but it can't contradict the idea of justice because Hashem is perfect and all of his various, all the various parts of his personality are all one and they have to work together. So where do those two fit together? How do you fit the mercy with the justice? And the answer is, as we just described, Hashem sees the future. Hashem is always creating. And Hashem is looking not just at you as you are today, that you, you know, say someone just messed up, did something wrong, but that's not the end. There's a future. There's a grain of good in the person, and there's something to develop. So Hashem waits. Now, a person still has free will. He can still choose not to do the right thing, not to do tshuva and, and repent. But Hashem gives him time. Hashem gives him time. There will be justice eventually. And Hashem is not limited to this world. There's also the next world. There's the afterlife. Hashem is not limited. There will be justice at some point over the course of history. But Hashem is willing to wait. And he's willing to wait and wait and wait forever or not forever, but for a long time. 
to see what a person's going to do, to give a person opportunity after opportunity to repent and to change what he's doing and to develop his potential. That's mercy. It's not justice. It's not, you know, immediate strict justice where the person just has to die because he's a rebellious person. On the other hand, it doesn't contradict the concept of justice. It gives a person a chance to come back to Hashem and to develop his potential and then somehow make up for what he did wrong. It's a concept we refer to as Erech Apayim. Hashem has patience. He has infinite patience. He's not actually offended by what we do, but he has this concept of justice. But he's willing to wait, and he can wait as long as it takes, as long as there's still an opportunity, which is as long as a person's alive. As long as a person, as long as Hashem grants us life, we still have the opportunity to take advantage of all the various opportunities that he puts in our way to develop and to do tshuva. So that's something that was introduced into the world as soon as man was created. And that's Hashem Elohim in the second chapter. Whereas until then, it's just Elohim. Okay, we're still recording if you want. I can send you the link. Okay. All right, I want to uh, focus now a little bit on the second verse. So we introduced last time the, the Ramban, how he approaches the first Pasuk in the Torah, Bereshis bara Elohim, Eis HaShemayim Ve'Eis Haaretz, Hashem created the heavens and the earth. And we talked about this idea that if he created this heavens and the earth on the first day, then what did he create for the rest of the time? And we offered various possible uh, explanations for that. The way the Ramban approaches it, as we said last time, is that Shemayim and Aretz, the heaven and earth, were not fully formed. He created the original uh, matter, the original unformed, un undeveloped matter of heaven, and the original unformed, undeveloped matter of earth, he created those two ideas, those two uh, primordial matters, which I don't even know if, if they were so physical. I don't know if we would have seen them if we looked. But on, on some level, he created the first beginnings of matter. That was the first thing that was created out of nothing, and from that, everything developed. So then we go to verse 2, Pasuk Beis. Pasuk Beis presents us with a picture of chaos. The universe has begun to become to come into existence, but nothing is formed. It says, The land was empty. It was empty and void. There was darkness on the face of the deep. So meaning there was darkness, there was water, but they were all mixed together and... and uh, unformed. And this is the part I want to focus on. It says the spirit of Hashem was hovering over the water. Now what does that mean? That, that's a, that's a, uh, an, one of the aspects of this chaos that existed at that time where there's water and air and light and dark and everything's mixed together. There's the spirit of Hashem floating on the water. What, what does that mean? So there are many different explanations for this, uh, which on a deeper level, they're all really one idea. Uh, some people explain that Ruach Elohim is just the, the concept of air. We talked about the four elements last time. So the, one, the element of, of air, of Ruach, was just floating there mixed with everything else. Rashi says it refers to the Kisei HaKavu, the, the uh, Hashem's throne. Now, Hashem's throne is not to be understood literally. It's a mystical concept. It's a metaphysical idea, uh, whatever that is. But another explanation which I want to focus on, the Ruach Elohim is Hashem's spirit. The spirit of Hashem, which we... we the word Ruach appears many times in Scripture. Uh, it means wind. But it can also mean the spirit of Hashem that he breathes into man. So Hashem has this, it's not Hashem's spirit. It's, you know, Hashem is infinite. He's, he can't be uh, defined, as we said. But he has this ruach, he has this spirit which he breathes into man. 
and really what she breathes into the entire creation, which animates creation, but especially which animates man, man's soul. As we'll see at the end of the chapter, Hashem breathed his soul, he breathed into man, man's soul was breathed into him by from Hashem. So that soul, that ruach, which is partially you know, part of Hashem, it's also something he breathes into us, it's kind of this divine uh, idea, was floating over the water. And what does that mean that it was floating over the water? It means that it didn't have a place to rest. It was floating. It was stuck in limbo. Hashem created the world. He wants to invest his spirit into it. He wants to put this into the world and, and, and invest his purpose into the world. But the purpose of creation, the, the final result of creation, had not yet been created. So Hashem's spirit is just waiting for something. And it's, it's floating over the water. It's waiting to be expressed. And we'll go through the story of creation, and it's, you know, Hashem creates light, Hashem creates the sky, He separates the dry land, He creates the trees, He creates the sun and the moon, and this spirit never rests. The Ruach Elohim never stops hovering over the water. It's not really mentioned again, but it never stops resting. We don't find it uh, finding a resting place until man is created. When man is created, man is the purpose of creation, who Hashem gives mastery over all of creation, He gives to man. When man is created, Hashem breathes His Spirit into the man. And as we've been discussing, it's not just man in general, it's the, it's the person who, or the people who decide to serve Hashem. They're the ones who end up with this Spirit. So the Spirit of Hashem is waiting for whoever is going to serve Hashem, who Hashem is going to invest with His Spirit. And that's what we find when we look at the, uh, our forefathers and the way they're described. We, we hear, we, 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 the Torah talks about Hashem standing over them. Like we had in last week's parasha, Hashem is standing over Yaakov as Yaakov sleeps on the Temple Mount. And He stands over Avraham as Avraham is about to perform his bris milah, he's about to circumcise. Hashem is standing over him. Uh, in this week's parasha, it talks about Yosef, who had Ruach Elohim Bo... Sorry, next week's parasha. Uh, Miketz. Uh, One of these parashas coming up. <laughs> it talks about Ruach Elohim Bo, that Hashem's uh, spirit was, was in Yosef. Yosef was uh, inspired by the spirit. He was very wise. He was able to explain Paro's dream, and he was able to you know, reorder the entire agricultural system of Egypt in order to prepare for the famine. You know, this was all inspiration from Hashem, and Paro describes that as Ruach Elohim Bo, Hashem's spirit is in Yosef. So this spirit that animates man, this spirit that inspires man, that gives man wisdom, was the spirit of Hashem. It's part of Hashem, if we can understand what that means. And it's something that he breathes into man. So that spirit is hovering over the water, and it's waiting for a place to rest until the purpose of the universe gets created. The third verse says, Vayomer Elohim yihi or, vayhi or. Hashem says, let there be light, and there was light. Now what was this light? There was no sun, there was no moon, there were no stars. They were created on the fourth day. This is the first day of creation, and Hashem's creating light. So, there are different uh, levels at which we can understand this also. For the time being, let's just think of it as a regular light, without the sun. Hashem created light before He created the sun. In fact, some say that He took that light and put it into the sun. Now, what that means in this, in uh, how that compares with with what we know of the sun from physics, I don't know. But uh, Hashem created light on the first day. It was a normal light that illuminated the world. Again, we'll, we'll soon see a different uh, possible explanation for this light. So Hashem creates light, 
And then it says, Vayara Lukim Esaor Kitov, Hashem sees that this light is good. Vayavdela Lukim Bein Ha'oro Bein Achoshe. Then Hashem separated between light and darkness. So Hashem sees the light is good, and then He separates between light and darkness. Sorry, my, my notes are a little bit out of order right now, so I'm just trying to find where, where this was. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Apologize. Okay, so Vayar al Kemis or Kitov. Hashem sees that the light is good. Now, what does that mean? It, it is something that gets repeated on every day of creation. Hashem creates something and he sees that it's good. What does it mean he sees that it's good? Of course, it's good. He created it. Hashem's not going to mess up on his creation. He is perfect and all powerful. So, if he created something, it's probably going to be good. And the Ramban explains that this is actually a very important concept. When it says, Vayara lukim or kitov, it means Hashem ratified it. Every creation, throughout the six days of creation, it says, Vayomer elokim, Hashem said, let there be something. Hashem created by talking, or maybe even just by thinking. He says, let there be light, and there was light. But then there's another step to the creation. Hashem saw that it was good. Hashem ratified this creation and he allowed it to continue existing. Now that's a very important concept. Nothing exists that Hashem didn't create. But also nothing exists that Hashem doesn't want to exist. There's nothing Hashem created that then got out of hand. There's no such thing. Hashem didn't have any Frankenstein moment where he created something and then, you know, it was just too much for him and, and you know, it just got out of hand and it did what he didn't want. And, you know, we're sometimes inclined to believe that did happen because we see there are people that do things Hashem doesn't like. There are murderers in the world. There are people stealing. There are people doing all types of bad things. In fact, if you look at the story of the flood, Hashem had to reset. He had to destroy everything and restart over. So it looks to us like, you know, he messed up. He created something, he created man, and, and man just got out of hand, and he had to just wipe them out. It's not so. Vayara lukim esor kitov. Anything that Hashem created that didn't work out the way, nothing worked out differently than he planned. But if, if anything were to work out differently than he planned, then it just would stop existing. If it's not good in his eyes, it doesn't exist. Hashem created, he also constantly recreates, constantly allows things to continue existing. There are many episodes in the Torah where if you look at the various, usually the Kabbalistic uh, commentators, they'll explain that people actually tried to take advantage of Hashem. There's an expression that's used, Yodea ribono umechavin limrod bo. People who recognize Hashem, they know who He is, they understand that they're created by Him, but they choose to rebel against Him, which is a very difficult concept. Why would anybody do that? If you really know that Hashem created you and really know that He's giving you life, and while you're rebelling against Him, He's, he's the one who's allowing you to continue to exist, what does that even mean? Well, how could you possibly rebel against him? Now, I understand falling for temptation, but we're talking about just wanting to rebel while he's giving you the energy to rebel against him. Why would anyone do that? So the explanation that's given is that these people were bad people, and they wanted to take advantage of Hashem's system. Hashem has a system in place. And they thought they could get out of that. They thought they could use that against him. For example, um, Paro. Paro made a decree, all the Jewish boys get thrown in the river. Why did he pick the river? Because he knew that after the flood of Noah, 
Hashem is never going to destroy the world through a flood ever again. He said that. He promised. So Paro figured, I can outwit him. I'll destroy the Jewish people in water. And Hashem has a principle. He always responds to things measure for measure. He always punishes people by doing the thing that they did. So if I use water to kill people, Hashem will never kill me with water because he can't destroy the world with water. So there's Paro trying to outsmart Hashem. Now that was a miscalculation because Hashem said he will never destroy the world with water. Not that he'll never punish anybody with water. But there were other people that tried similar ideas. There's a, a mystical explanation for the, the Tower of Babel. The Migdal Bavo that they built. They built this tower and they tried to fight against Hashem and they tried to they tried to, it doesn't even say what they tried to do. The Torah does not very, it's not very explicit as to what they were trying to do with this tower, but Hashem looked at it and he just dispersed them. So what is it that they were trying to do? According to the al Sheikh, the al Sheikh was a Kabbalistic commentator. He explains that they were trying to, they were trying to outwit Hashem. Hashem has a system where he wants to create holiness in this world. He wants people to do mitzvahs and bring him into the world. Whenever there's the opposite of that, whenever people are trying to sin and are trying to, uh, you know, do things wrong, it causes Hashem to distance himself from this world. Well, they figured that if they can calculate it right, they can if they can get rid of all the good people and if they, they can make this kingdom of evil people, they can actually drive Hashem out of the world and they can thwart his plan and they'll take over and they don't have to worry about Hashem anymore. So that's this idea. They know Hashem, they're not denying him, but they have figured out, they thought they figured out a way to outsmart him and just to drive him out of the world. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't stupid. It was very smart. It was. It was a very smart idea. They, they had to have a very deep understanding of the world's purpose and a deep understanding of how Hashem relates to the world. But they missed one thing, which is that you can't outsmart Hashem. Hashem has it all planned out, like we talked about last week with the chessboard. Right? Hashem has the the ultimate plan. Every possibility that might happen. He has a plan for that. And even though he does have rules by which he rules the world, those rules are nuanced enough that they can deal with any possibility that might come up because Hashem can foresee any possible any possibility that might come up. Such so as an example of this idea. But the idea is not just how Hashem deals with people, it's how he deals with anything. As long as Hashem wants something to exist, it exists. When he doesn't want it to exist, it doesn't exist. That's why Yaralu Kim Kitov, Hashem saw it was good and therefore it was ratified to continue to exist. As soon as he sees it's not good, it no longer exists. And if that happens, we understand that that was also part of the plan. If there was a time when Hashem had to wipe out humanity with a flood, that means Hashem had that as part of his plan. He also had it as part of his plan that there was one good family that was saved. Humanity didn't disappear, it was rebuilt. It's always part of Hashem's plan. Hashem has everything planned out and whatever is supposed to exist, exists. Which, by the way, is a very important idea to keep in mind as, we're, uh, as we have this environmental summit going on in uh, Dubai. Humanity cannot destroy the world. That's a fact. Now, we can be responsible. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't be responsible. We can be responsible about how we how we use our, our our resources. We can be responsible about how we affect the world around us. But the fact remains that Hashem created the world, and He's not going to allow it to just disappear. It's going to work out the way Hashem plans. It's vayara lokim kitov. Yeah, I think the next topic will take quite a bit of time, and we're. Uh, 
getting toward the end of the hour, so I think we'll stop here. I will, however, remember this time to stop for questions. One second. Let me just unmute people, and then I'll take your question. Um, no, that didn't work. Oh, I'm sorry. People are unmuted. Okay, if anybody has a question, raise your hand. You can unmute yourself. But Dennis, yes. Actually, two things. Okay. Um, it's been, I've been hear, heard that creation is constantly working. Yeah. So how does that conflict with on the seventh day at Shabbos and you shouldn't do any work? Hashem is, is constantly creating. So you mean how does he create on Shabbos? Yeah. That is a good question. I, uh, I'll have to say I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm sure this has been written about. There is, the Gemara does talk about, someone actually asked this question, you know, how does Hashem, if Hashem doesn't work on Shabbos, how is it that he has the winds blowing across the world and they're they're traveling, you know, way beyond the, the Shabbos limits mm -hmm. and they're carrying things. Um, and and the, if I recall correctly, the answer that was given is that the world is all Hashem's. So this is like, you know, it's, we're all in Hashem's house, right? Mm -hmm. Within your own house, you're allowed to carry. Um, but that doesn't answer your question. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the answer is, though. Okay. The other is, um, in the beginning of tonight's class, you were describing the infiniteness of Hashem. Yeah. But we constantly say He when we refer to his being yeah what brought that about what wouldn't it wouldn't there shouldn't be some other infinite term other than a male an infinite pronoun you mean well yeah just some of the you know always say hashem instead of he hashem did this hashem did, does that instead of he doesn't have an arm or a leg or an eye right it when I hear someone talking and using he as a pronoun for Hashem, I'm all I'm thinking some kind of image. Right. You know. So yeah, I mean it's very difficult to talk about Hashem and to talk to Hashem and at the same time keep in mind that he doesn't have an image. It's very difficult to, to keep those so two things now in mind. You could say Hashem doesn't have an image instead of he doesn't have an image. Well, I'm going to challenge that. Okay. Because the same way I can't say he, I also can't say Hashem. Mm -hmm. Because Hashem is also limiting. Any any name we give him is limiting. Mm -hmm. And a proper noun is no worse is no better than a pronoun. Okay. Uh, the reason he's referred to in the masculine, I, I can give two reasons, and I think they're both true. Um. Number one, I mean, the masculine up until a few decades ago was always the generic. When, when, when you're referring to something that doesn't have a gender, he was mm -hmm. the way to refer to it. Or, or if you're referring to a group, you're referring to someone who's unidentified. Mm -hmm. It could be he or she, but people didn't say that until uh, pretty recently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he was just the way you said it. But more importantly, um, we're, we're talking about how Hashem chooses to relate to the world. And He relates to a world which, in a way, which is represented by His name, Yudke Vavke, mm -hmm. or is related to, it was represented by His name, Elohim. In the same way, you can say He relates to the world in, in a way that's represented by a masculine pronoun. Now, exactly how that is, is a little deeper than I'm going to go right now. But there is that concept. He relates to the world in a masculine manner, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look throughout Scripture, when he when he when he talks to us as a people, he refers to us as his wife. In in Shira Shirim, in the Song of Songs, Hashem is the husband, and the Jewish people is the wife. Mm -hmm. Now, what what that means on the Kabbalistic level, I'm not going to get into right now, partially because I'm not qualified to. Um, <laughs> But also because it's a it's a big digression. But there is that idea that Hashem relates to us in a masculine manner. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just trying not to think of different 
human images whenever I hear referred to as he. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. the, the truth is, though, there is, there is something to be said for not thinking of an image, but for thinking of a personality. You know, because we, we, we spend so much time philosophizing away uh, the, the idea of any kind of body or any kind of definition. But we, so if you do that too much, you start thinking about Shem as just an abstract concept, which is how the, the Greek philosophy looked at him. They believed in this, you know, original creative intelligence or whatever they called it. But they, they believed and they proved this philosophically that Hashem, as, a, as an infinite being, can't relate to the world. And therefore, you know, maybe he did create the world in the sense that the world is a natural outcome of his existence, but not that he actually is aware of it. And so they, they kind of just abstracted him out of existence. Mm -hmm. He was so infinite that he was non-existent for them. And I think that's true for a lot of people today also. And, but for us, it's, it's actually very important to focus on that other part of this dichotomy, the other side of the coin, which is that, yes, Hashem does exist, and Hashem does relate to us, and in that sense, He has a personality, or at least He wants us to view that, view Him that way. So not as a body, but a personality. Mm -hmm. Or being with certain traits. Yeah. <clears throat> or... Even even more than that, an undefined being who chooses to exercise certain traits. You know, however you want to say it to sound right, but that's. Uh... Okay. Are there any questions from other people on the call? <clears throat> I have a question that might be a little unrelated. Okay. The last time you said, I think it's the word shemaim, right? Yeah. Heaven, heavens. You said it means like a pair of heavens. Yeah. That's how I understood it at least. A, a pair of shum. Shum means there. Shum means there. So a pair of there. Two theirs. There's there that direction, there in that direction, because heaven is really a sphere around the earth. So there's one heaven, but like two physical directions. Yeah. That it exists in relative to you, I guess. Yeah. I understand. I it, it does depend, though, how you what you mean when you say heaven. Uh -huh. You know, uh, the Russians, when they sent up their satellite, the first satellite, the first thing they did when they got there was they went into all the schools in the Soviet Union and they said, look, there, there's we went up to space, there's no angels, there's no God, there's no nothing. We've, we've proven it. So, you know, the word heaven has two connotations. There's a spiritual idea of heaven, and then there's a physical sky or space. And uh, if you're talking about the spiritual concept, I wouldn't say there's two, that there's just this one concept. But in the physical sense, the, just the physical heaven, there's, there, yeah, there are two. This is all directions. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, if you enjoyed it, invite your friends. Uh, let me get this recording. Stop. Okay. <clears throat>